her passion for biomimicry as a tool, but also what it would mean to uh, businesses and how it could be potentially be used as a transformative tool uh, to start thinking outside uh, the normal uh, school of thoughts in terms of how we, uh, we manage businesses and grow economy. Um, the way we got all connected, actually, uh, Norbert is on the line as well. Uh, he is the connector to this group. We actually um, had the pleasure to meet Anthony uh, at the International Conference for Sustainable Entrepreneurship last year in Montreal, which uh, we uh, presented some uh, elements of biomimicry to this group, but also got to uh, meet Anthony and um, Margot and myself. Um, kind of all start uh, thinking about how we could potentially share this uh, this tool that we have uh, with your community, and that's how we we got connected. And um, so, thank you, Anthony, for 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 being the connector, and thank you, Norbert, for bringing all these different uh, uh, various connections and how we all kind of following the same uh, same goal of uh, finding ways to restore the earth, but also uh, uh, a better way for us as humans to fit in instead of uh, trying to imposing yourself on the earth. So, uh, and it's a lot of the principles of biomimicry. So I will uh, go ahead and start. Uh, Margot will end uh, with some, some sort of a, a story on how this relates to businesses, but also how businesses are using biomimicry in, 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 in different, different ways. And we really want to make it this as a dialogue. So please, uh, I will like ask any of the moderators to look at the chat. If there's questions you want to ask during the presentation, we could stop uh, and talk, but we also have time at the end. So uh, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so I personally work for the Biomimicry Institute. I focus mostly on innovation, kind of the idea from uh, lab to market, how to take a biological process or innovation and, and try to figure out how do you bring it to the market and, and really look at uh, the commercialization process. I also uh, recently just joined in um, UC San Diego, University of California, San Diego, and I uh, manage two incubators on campus. And maybe there's something to, to uh, let this group know. Um, I am um, starting teaching my students uh, the flourishing business model canvas. Uh, and all the other tools that you have. So there is definitely this uh, inspiration from us to really try to uh, change how the young minds are looking at business and especially innovation uh, and looking at systemic problems to try to solve. So uh, let me go to the slide. And I might be a little bit of a, I'm gonna move here. Just give me a second. It won't allow me to move the slide. There we go. So biomimicry, I always like to start with this slide. I'm sure a lot of you, it sounds like, I, um, I would imagine, depending on where you live, we, we as humans have this deep connection with the outdoors. Um, if you look at um, even what you said at the beginning, the people that were on the land that we all live, uh, there were First Nation people here before us. Uh, the indigenous culture, was there before a lot of the uh, a lot of a lot of us, uh, unless we are uh, part of that group. But this connection to nature is deeply rooted in humans, and that's what makes us unique. Is this idea of wanting to connect with the outdoors, wanting to um, feel connected to all the beauty that is out there, and that's part of this this idea of how the natural em environment that we all take for granted in many ways is essential to the survival of humans in terms of how we are able to really feel better, right? When we spend more time outdoor, we're able to kind of function better as human beings. And, and I, I would actually even argue that we tend to be, uh, have more compassion and love for one, one, one another when, where we are actually spending more time outdoor than, than inside a building. So that's really an essential part of biomimicry as a practitioner. We take our, our groups outdoor, we take people to reconnect to nature. It's not just something you study in a lab or watch a video. You have to be out there and observe the organisms and be connected to that. So research I've shown, and I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this, that when you spend time outdoor, you feel more restored, more alive, less stressed, less depressed, and more focused. And that's something very essential 
uh, to the practice of biomimicry of this idea of, of if we're going to be a steward of the earth, we have to also realize that the earth is giving us a lot of great benefits and, and, uh, and, and it's, it's an important element to have. And, and uh, especially around children, uh, a lot of studies shows that children that spend more time out there are definitely uh, tend to not develop things like diabetes or, or ADD. Uh, and, and that's even common in adults as well. Um, as you're probably all familiar, the system that we live in is a, it's a very much uh, extractive model. I'm not going to dwell on this too much, but uh, essentially it's a very linear process, even though we're trying to break away from that process. But in biomimicry, that's something where, where we want to intervene in that system. Um, and part of it is because it's very, very energy intensive, as you all know, and it's sort of when we start thinking about everything that we have, that we use, that we take for granted, um, we don't all, all essentially realize the embedded energy in that process. And in, in biomimicry, we refer often to this idea of, of the amount of heat required. So think of chemicals that needs to be heated at high temperature in order for them to bound together. The amount of force that we need to have to create certain shapes. And then the treatment aspect is really the amount of chemicals we put in all the products that we have. So that's really kind of where we've, we've been uh, uh, taking advantage of this for a long time, but you know, this is obviously coming to an end. This system is not, it's not sustainable. It also has all kinds of, 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 of other challenges, not only as humans from a public health issue, but it, it's essentially from an environmental issue. It's, 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 uh, it's no longer uh, viable. And that's sort of where biomimicry becomes uh, this potential entry point for how do we redesign an economy that is not energy intensive? How do we redesign an economy that is not carbon intensive? Um, and I think today with this unprecedented times that we're living by staying home and not using petroleum product, there's sort of this awakening happening all over the world where people realize that not only we could still somewhat function as a society, I mean, there's a lot of people suffering and I totally realize that, but but we also realize there's a lot of unnecessary need in our system, right? Whether the amount of excessive traveling, the amount of excessive products that we buy that have no real purpose, or except to, uh, potentially to just give us some joy in a very short term. Um, so all that kind of brings up an important thing for all of us. I like this picture. This is a um, picture of China that was shared recently. Um, prior to the shutdown of their economy and, and after. And, and what's staggering is the amount of pollution that is just gone. And I'm, I'm sure you all read the news about um, places in India, being able to see the Himalayas, they haven't seen in 40 years. All the major cities are reporting best air quality in 50 years. So it is potentially giving us what nature, mother nature is giving us a signal here. It says, you know what, your system is not only sickening the earth but is not sustainable so perhaps like in nature any disturbance in the system could lead to some great uh transformation and that's sort of what um what i was trying to make here as a point but where we are as as a community it's we can't be doing business as usual try to reduce the impact which is a lot of the, the things that we've done over the years a lot of the larger companies are still doing that they're really looking at lessening the impact by reducing the energy impacts or the embedded energies in solutions or product, we really need to move to this uh, restorative and, and ultimately regenerative design. And that's sort of where the deeper sustainable practices need to come into play. So there are not a civil blood out there of one way to do this. I think there's many approaches to this. Uh, one of them uh, to this interest of this group is, is uh, looking into biology, looking into nature, and can we learn anything from some of the principles in nature? And that's sort of what we want to uh, kind of explore with you today. So um, maybe some of you are already familiar, but in biomimicry, there are kind of three entry points, if you will, that how you could come in and uh, seek uh, advice uh, from some of these organisms out there. It's from a form standpoint, so how does nature create certain shapes? Um, we often refer as the uh, form fits the function, so a particular function the, the, this particular organism is trying to achieve. The area that I'm personally quite interested in is the process, how nature, nature makes things, makes materials, uh, a very unique chemistry. It's an area that we often do not understand very well because 
It happens at a very different scale, usually at a nanoscale where proteins are combined. You may wonder what that center picture is. It's actually a spigots from a spider. Uh, each spigots have a different strand and they all are assembled at room temperature uh, um, um, and uh, 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 ambient pressure, but it's basically protein applied there. And the latter one, which is also quite interesting to, to me as well, is this idea of system. How does system in the environment function? How does a forest function? Right? How does a coral reef function? There's all kinds of elements of not only information sharing, but exchange and so on. And one thing to be really clear, uh, we as humans tend to run, run mostly on materials and technology. Nature runs on information and rely on abundance of, of resources. Right? They, there's not such a thing as a scarcity model in nature. Right? So whatever is abundant, that's what the natural world would use. So it's the, the, the using these, uh, these, these, these approaches. Um, one quick example I wanted to share, I'm, I'm a big fan of this particular organism, is um, a tardigrade on the right side. Maybe you've seen it before. They're also known as water bears. Um, tardigrade, as well as brine shrimp, have this unique ability that I find astonishing to me is in absence of water, they could remain dormant, right? So they could dehydrate themselves, if you will, using a pretty um, interesting approach in, in having a way to remove all the water from the cells and, and have this protected layer of protein uh, that protects the organs. They could, they could remain dormant for a long time, right? So something that most humans would uh, love to better understand. And some companies actually looked at this process and applied to things like vaccines, right? So if you think about how we transport vaccine in areas of the world where there are no refrigeration system, uh, this is a way to store uh, vaccines at room temperature. There's a local company here in San Diego that did also use this approach of process in nature uh, to store DNA and RNA uh, a sample uh, at room temperature. So this is an, a one thing to keep in mind. There is a lot of these interesting things. The, the reality, it's very hard to go from biology to design, uh, from biology to engineering and design. Um, and it's also quite hard once, even if you figure out the biology from biology to an actual business, right? To figure out where is that going to make sense, right? And that's the challenge that a lot of the early entrepreneurs in this space struggle. Um, one thing to keep in mind, these are some of the kind of the general rules, you know, in the man-made system, as I mentioned, we tend to be more linear. Nature is more cyclical, the way nature works. Nature banks on diversity, you know, diversity system allows it to be more resilient, it's all about optimization versus op maximization for us. Um, uses very low energy process, self-assembly from the bottom up, um, relying mostly on local source, where right? not looking at the cheapest or the rarest materials. Here are some of uh, the principles that I think might, be, might resonate with this group that, that might be good to keep in mind on how this natural system that we use um, as sort of as a mentor and a guide that could be useful for businesses is nature runs on sunlight, for instance, right? So all life on Earth, except for 2% of very obscure organisms that live in the depth of the ocean that may rely on some other forms, um, relies on sunlight, right? Which is obviously for us as an economy should be what we should be doing. Nature uses only the energy it needs, right? It only uses what it needs and leave the rest in the ground. Like a tree would not take all the water for itself. It only needs what it takes for that day and leave the rest in the ground. So this is this idea of sharing. Uh, as I mentioned before, nature fits form to function with this idea of how certain shapes allow to have uh, ability to have a specific function, which in the case of biology allows to have this uh, 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 fitness, uh, biological fitness for the organism. Nature recycled everything, as you probably all know this, right? There's this closed loop system. Everything gets to be reused, breaking down into very specific process, which is not the case for us in many ways. Um, rewards cooperation. It's really commonly, uh, people tend to, tend to not realize that nature is not very competitive. I mean, there are competitive processes nature, right? From the prey predators relationship. But a lot of the times, it's much more about collaboration, right? The, the symbiosis relationship with organisms are essential. Like, for instance, the best example I can give you is a tree and uh, the mycorrhizan uh, mushroom are an essential 
uh, cooperation between the tree and the mycorrhizae, right? A mycorrhizae is able to get sugar from the tree and the tree is able to get some specific minerals like phosphorus from the mycorrhizae. And by the way, the mycorrhizae connects all the trees, so the tree uses the mycorrhizae as a communication system to share information among their peers. So it's also an amazing process there. As I mentioned before, nature banks on diversity, um, focus on local expertise, what's out there close to them, that's what they're gonna be using. Um, and then really this idea of nat nature curbs excess from within, right? This idea of never, you know, um, um, try to be the biggest, the largest, uh, there's a sense of, of optimization there. So I'm gonna now turn, in, turn it over to Margot and she'll uh, be able to illustrate some how some businesses have been able to use this mythology uh, approach from biomimicry and into uh, uh, creating a, a, a truly regenerative business uh, model. And I, ne you. I left the last one, yes. Thank you, Jacques. And um, thanks so much to Anthony and to Norbert and to all of you for being here, for having us here. Um, in your tradition, I come from a place uh, of the Osage people on the border of Missouri and Kansas, and I am in the Little Platte uh, watershed. So I appreciate the way you let things off. Um, you know, as Jacques said, we really are, could be, if we choose to be, at a crossroads. Uh, and uh, certainly we have the opportunities to recalibrate, to make choices in our businesses now. Uh, as well as in our underlying values uh, to shift ways of doing business more in line with our non-human neighbors uh, or at least deploy their strategies. Uh, Jacques gave you the basics of biomimicry and how to do it. I've been asked by my students uh, and by colleagues many times, but how do I get biomimicry into my company? So that's what I'm here to address. Uh, in fact, I did so in a book that's going to be coming out this fall, and I was going to tell you the stories of a couple of com uh, companies, but I realized it would take way longer than we have, and we really want to have discussion with you. So what I think I'm going to do is kind of compare and contrast how one small entrepreneurial uh, company deployed biomimicry and how one multinational although now the entrepreneurial venture is, is a multinational, uh, but it didn't start out that way. Uh, so I'm gonna talk to you about InCycle Corporation and Nike. And I will talk to you in terms of their values, in terms of what their innovation decision was, you know, how they decided to use biomimicry or bioinspiration, um, how they integrated it into their company, what types of feedback they each looked at, and of course the metrics that each of them used and found. So to begin with, um, we'll start with our small entrepreneur. A uh, couple of guys uh, living in the Northeast, uh, and Mark was hanging out on a hillside when the Northeast blackout came about. And he and Roman, his partner, had been trying to think of what kind of a new business they were going to come up with. They had started businesses together before, but they hadn't really thought of anything until this point. And he said, you know, really energy management. He started thinking about the grid and all the challenges with the grid. And so they decided to do something in that realm. And they had both read a book, Emergence, uh, by Steven Johnson. And so that's really how they got attached to bioinspiration and biomimicry. Um, to let you in on some internal jargon, uh, there are a number of us that look at biomimicry, uh, which uh, is deployed in ways that it meshes kindly with these life's principles or the way the earth works, uh, like Jacques was uh, describing to you. Um, biomimicry, bioinspiration, bionics, biotilization, and uh, biotris, there's a whole number of them. And so if I use the term biom star, I'm just talking about the whole, the whole kettle of fish there. So, but uh, 
they were they were looking at this and and discovered it through through this book and emergent theory is based around bees and ants and how they behave a lot of people think that the bee uh, or the ant is a command control situation where the bee issues the queen bee issues orders but in fact that's not how it works at all uh, each bee or ant uh, communicates biochemically with all the other bees and ants and they do so with short simple directives so um, when the larder is full they've been operating on a directive to um, gather food gather food gather food and they they communicate that to each other and then when the larder is full they say you know clean out or build or you know just very short sweet directives and that's how they operate and so um, Mark and Roman said, you know, do you think there's a, a way we could build a company around this emergent theory? And uh, they were a computer scientist and a computer engineer. And so in terms of integrating it into the company, they, uh, they had the expertise. So they went ahead and, and put in the work and uh, they found their niche in uh, creating these little units that they could put on uh, HVAC systems, on the big uh, heating and air conditioning units that were on buildings uh, that were currently using about four to six units. So this would be like a high school gymnasium, a uh, movie theater, a big box store. So um, that, that is the area that they saw as their sweet spot. And uh, so they went to work uh, and came up with a swarm algorithm so that if they stuck their little units onto the HVAC units themselves, they could talk to each other. And so traditional HVAC, the way it would work is that when things would get too warm, all of the fans from all the HVAC units would come on at once. And they knew that there had to be a, this better way of, of doing it. And so what their small units did was communicate with all the other units and say, you know, hey, unit number two, I'm turning on my unit number one fans now. And so you don't have to turn yours on quite yet, okay? Okay, now you turn yours on, and then unit number two says to unit number three, and I'm personifying this, of course, but they all communicate with each other, and so they had two benefits, actually. They were saving the clients money, but they were also knocking the top off that grid surge at certain times a day when um, everybody's using things all at once. Um, I wish they would come up with a unit for Zoom so that we wouldn't get knocked off when we're all on Zoom at once. But um, that's, that's sort of the way that, that they got started. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and go just all the way through theirs. Their feedback that, that they were, uh, that they used was once they had this swarm algorithm, they thought it would be, you know, it was almost incumbent on them to go out to other academic leaders and and get it tested and maybe look for other good good ideas and whatnot and what they were met with was um, uh, no that's not how you do it uh, no that's we've tried that it doesn't work that way uh, no it's it's we're not ready for that yet and they went to the first one and they thought huh, that's strange, you know, everything that we've done, it seems like we're ready. In fact, um, they said the only time they uh, made mistakes, it always circled back around to what they called stupid human tricks. It was them making a mistake with the algorithm, not the algorithm's fault that they had used from this, this swarm theory, the emergent theory. And so they went to one, they went to two, they went to three, and they finally thought, you know, we think this is going to work. We're not going to pay attention to what these guys are saying because they're saying, don't do it. We're going to go ahead and try it. 
and and they tried it and it worked and this has happened in more than one entrepreneurial effort where they went out to get outside testing and were told oh you can't do that it's not time yet um another company <clears throat> It's, it's important if you don't have the expertise to go outside and get the outside expertise. PAC Scientific is a good uh, example of this. Um, when, when the owner of, of PAC, Jay Harmon, uh, was looking for expertise, he, he went outside. Um, but a lot of times it's even hard to get the people with the outside expertise to buy into what you're doing. So you just have to be persistent you know, in his case, um, he was working with a uh, America's Cup engineer, and and he was saying, you know, no, this isn't the way these boats work. Um, he was working on a boat at the time, and he said it does. And you know, if if it doesn't, I'll I'll eat my I'll eat my hat. Um, and of course, Jay proved him wrong over time. But so. So the important message in this is that they went to the outside expertise and when they were met with negative, they went ahead and worked on it anyway. And so uh, they ended up uh, applying this first to a movie theater and the movie theater uh, recognized a 28% savings right off the bat on their energy. And Roman and it, they were small. This was their first, their first uh, baby. And so they ran everything behind the scenes. They didn't trust it to teach somebody else to do it. They wanted to see how things worked, when the energy was used to the max, when it wasn't. And so um, th though they started small, now they're in 16 countries on five continents. So it, it really paid them to hang in there and, um, now they're seeing savings and they applied it to a school that was one of their next ones that um, saved $35,000 in the first year, which the school then applied back into um, other sustainable techniques. And uh, one of their latest is a big box store that save, is saving about $2 million annually on their energy. So, that's how things worked in the entrepreneurial setting. As you might guess, it was a very direct, the leaders were the ones that were interested in biomimicry and they carried it through and now they've taught it to, you know, all of the people that work for them. One interesting note is they didn't use it to sell their product. They didn't want to use sustainability. They didn't want to preach to their clients. They wanted their outcomes to be what sold their clients. So they were very careful in the beginning. And now, you know, you'll see the swarm logic all over their website and whatnot. But initially, they, they wanted their, their product to prove itself, not the biomimicry to prove itself. Um, comparing that to a multinational corporation like Nike, the leader did not bring it in. They got into sustainability sort of as everybody was building corporate sustainability reports, they felt like, okay, we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to get into this. And actually, um, I think it was before even their first corporate sustainability report, their first biomimetic product was a shoe. It was when adventure racing was getting big and uh, the designer, Mike Freeton, was looking at mountain goat hooks and they have a very hard rim around the edge. And in the middle, if any of you are climbers, they have a very pliable sole. And so they could smear onto the side a very steep uh, granite or they could perch with that edge on, on, the, uh, on very thin um, outcroppings. And so that was without any kind of knowledge about formal uh, BioM star, biomimicry or anything. They just are people that are outside naturally. And they said, huh, you know, look at what that goat to could do. I wonder how it does that. And so they came to it that way. Um, until uh, Darcy Winslow was in their product development and she went over to Asia and saw a very pregnant line worker um, on, on uh, working in a, a factory where they attached the soles of shoes to the uppers 
And she said, does the smell in here ever bother you? Because there were a lot of volatile uh, organic compounds in the air. And she says, only on Sunday. And that's, that was their day off. So she knew that you know, there was something going on there. And so she took that back to their head a chemist. And so they started working on creating a greener chemistry, substituting out those volatile organic compounds uh, for uh, inert or life-friendly uh, compounds instead. Meanwhile, uh, Darcy went to a conference and heard Dana Baumeister speak from um, the biomimicry, what was the biomimicry guild, now is biomimicry 3.8. And she was like, that's it. That's, that's what we're going to want to do. And so um, she had Dana come there, and her feedback was not outward. It was inside the company. And so she brought in people from across the company to uh, experience Dana's talk so she could see where it would resonate the most. And no surprise, it was the designers and the creatives where it resonated the most. But uh, the in, after Dana left and they were talking about how they were gonna deploy this, she went to the CEO and said, you know, if we're going to do this, if we're gonna be real about sustainability, we ha it can't be on its own. It has to be integrated into our business plan. And so um, that's what they began to do. And Dana came back and one of the most uh, prized areas and respected areas on the Nike campus is their library. And so they came in and uh, Dana came in and put a, a lot of natural objects in there, uh, taught the group biomimicry and how to do it. And all of this was going on while Dick was working in the labs. And they ended up replacing 147 chemicals which they began to refer to as green rubber. But then they did something else interesting, and it sort of um, shows where there's a cross connection between what you're doing as your work and what you're doing socially, uh, you know, for your social outcomes. Because what they had to do is take that intellectual property and share it with all the other shoe companies. Because in Asia, in those plants, there's a Nike run and then there's a Adidas run right next to it and a Puma run right next to it and a Reebok run. So if they wouldn't have shared that, it wouldn't have done anybody any good. Um, so they had a positive social outcome. Um, and when uh, Darcy was trying to sell this concept inside Nike, that she would carry around a pair of shoes and hold up one of the shoes and say, there's a, a third shoe here and that third shoe is how much waste we are landfilling and incinerating and she said that didn't cut it with anybody she she would receive some oh okay or oh wow that's but when she told them that that waste was worth 700 million dollars annually that got people's attention and so that really helped um spur that green chemistry uh, that Dick was working on. Um, now, to, to compare the two comp companies now, within Cycle, biomimicry and bioinspiration is still front and center uh, in, in Nike, and it, and it was there as they started their business. In Nike, it is one of the many tools they use, but it is not nearly as central and it, it's, I don't think um, anything odd about the fact that it wasn't the CEO that brought it in. Because if you look at another multinational corporation interface, their CEO brought the idea into them and said, thou shalt. And so that percolated down really, really well. So, you know, Dar Darcy really had to work at getting it uh, implemented in, in, within Nike. And so it just shows you kind of the power of the CEO, but at the same time, you know, even though the CEO didn't bring it to bear in Nike, um, it, it still is used as a tool. So there's a little comparison and contrast between those two. And I know we really want to get to you all with um, questions and conversations. So I'll be quiet now and, and let that begin. Yeah, thank you, Margo. Yeah, please let us know if you have any questions. So 
comments? So uh, one of the things that uh, I saw you guys review last year uh, at the conference was uh, life's principle. And one of the things we're, we're a group of designers, we design business models amongst other things, design organizations. So we're always looking for design principles that could be useful to us. And I was wondering if you could say something about life's principles and I don't know if you've got a slide you can put up to, to share it with everybody. I think that might be quite interesting for people. Yeah, that, that's that's a great comment, Anthony. So, uh, so we I I don't have it in this deck. I could look it up uh, quickly in a second. Um, the actual life principles. So, so life principles for those of you who are not familiar, are basically um, deep patterns that uh, Janine Benius and her and her team identify, and and they've been refined over the years, right? So, the one you're seeing on the screen are kind of the original life principle that Janine kind of identified when she did her initial work on her book. Uh, the one you're referring, uh, Anthony, uh, what's kind of been elaborated over, over time, and, and but they're in many ways um, very similar to what we have here, but there are seven life principles that, um, that basically becomes these deep patterns that close to, I would say, 98% of all organisms uh, on Earth kind of follow, including humans, right? So things like, obviously, we rely on gravity. Uh, you know, we're water-based. Uh, we use water-based chemistry. I mean, you were born in water. Um, this idea of uh, growth and development, uh, this idea of, of recycle, recycling and, and, uh, and, and green chemistry. But um, I'm, like, I'm, I'm happy to look for them and put it on the screen in a second. But the ones you're seeing right now are kind of, in a way, the original life principles uh, that kind of are based on what we have. So, in a way, if 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 you were if businesses were if you were a business leader, and that's what I tell my student, if you're a business leader and take some of these principles either in your design of your solution, whether it's a product, process, or, or system, or even how you operate your business, then you are pretty much in line to what the natural system would do right so if your business could run on 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 sun right on solar energy or renewable energy um if you can only maximize or optimize the energy you use in your system that would be uh, ideal if you could recycle everything uh if you could create collaboration among the different units or even different businesses this idea of exchange of resources so a lot of the work that I've seen around industrial symbiosis systems uh, are definitely in there where, to Margot's point, where the waste stream becomes a valuable input for someone else. Uh, and definitely one that is kind of in line today, this idea of diversity, right? If, if your system or your, even your entire values, value chain system is diverse, then you're more likely to withstand disturbance or shocks in the system, right? Um, so I'm happy to look for it, Anthony, but that's kind of uh, some of that. And um, Margo, if you want to add anything to it, feel free while I'll look for the life principles and I'll put it on the screen. Sorry, I, uh, I am coming to you from a farm and my internet connection took me away, so I oh. don't know what the question is. Oh, you're doing really well for that. Oh, you've been, <laughs> you've been uh, yeah, your, your talk was totally, yeah, go totally uh, uh, free from breaks and uh, well-received, so uh, okay. good timing. The question, Margo, uh, sorry, uh, Professor Jones, the question was about the life principles. Yeah. Anthony asked, when we did the, the workshop in Montreal, we, we talked about the life principles and how we can use the life principle as a, potentially a guide in, in either embedding them into a business model um, so I did show what I have on the screen right now, kind of the, the ones, for, the original life principle from Janine's book, but um, I basically give my thoughts on that, um, how the life principle could be used as a, uh, as a tool to guide a business in uh, going into this uh, journey to become more sustainable, but also kind of potentially moving into this uh, regenerative design and restorative design. But um, if you have any other comments, feel free. I'm going to look for the life principle itself and put it on the screen for everybody. Yeah, so I would just add, I, I think we're, we're also really interested in how these principles might enable the, 
uh, the, might connect to the business, different business models and how organizations can change the way they create value and draw natural resources in different ways and, and adapt these principles in their work processes for, um, you know, in, in new ways of new economic approaches. Margo, you're muted, we can't hear you. Okay, good, that's better. Thank you, Lori. Um, while Jacques is looking for those, um, to sort of address that, uh, I'll tell you the life's principles that Nike and Encycle uh, sort of followed. Um, one is using life-friendly chemistry. And so that definitely had a social impact uh, for the people who were um, on their factory lines. And it definitely had an economic impact because uh, they were looking at $700 million worth of materials that they were losing in the process that they were using. Um, so so in terms of that uh, resource efficient, and that means both in materials and energy. And so Nike definitely, you know, uh, their processes definitely hitched in with two of the six life's principles. Um, I think you could probably make an argument uh, that a third life principle was also and the ways that nature evolves to, uh, to survive create the unexpected and they reshuffle information so it can be used in different ways and he gets the circle up on on the screen um, it's interesting, life's principles, you know, if you're looking in the world of BioM Star, which is this broader group of uh, bioinspiration, biotris, and so on and so forth, that isn't a model that necessarily all of them use. But I, I think in some respects, if you have any biological background, you know, they make, it makes sense, you know, that, that uh, you know, nature uses life-friendly chemistry, for instance. Uh, because even uh, 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 poisons and, um, uh, you know, when you look at poisonous snakes, et cetera, that those things, those poisons will break down. They're water soluble. And so um, I told you I was going to tell you about Encycle. Encycle was also very resource efficient. Oh, this is the, the matrix. It's not circle got another one that, that this is a circle but uh, efficient uh, because uh, energy and uh, uh, they uh, integrate development with growth because those those small units that are placed on the HVAC systems and uh, they, they are modular and nested, which are all also part of uh, integrating development with growth. And principles is what those units are doing. They are measuring the heat or cold outside and then responding directly to that. That's how all of nature works. Um, so those are some examples. I think the only one that I didn't hit in some way was uh, that nature adapts to changing conditions and actually in cycles uh, units do that as well um, because as the temperature changes it'll switch on or off the number of fans. Um, Jacques do you want to say anything else about uh, since, since you've got it up there now about life's principles? Um, no I mean I think you've covered a lot of the a lot of the elements I mean this is this is uh, so there are these um, uh, six principles with uh, basically uh, sub principles underneath. Um, so as I mentioned before, when you look at this other one, 
these are kind of the original one. This is the ones that were kind of further elaborated by by the by Janine and her group. Um, but you know, for instance, this idea of be locally attuned and responsive. I mean, this idea of having understanding feedback loops and taking advantage of uh, cyc cyclical process is is really important in this idea of uh, cooperation and relationship, which is common in business, where this idea of competi competition, the competitive process in business, or even within a within a firm, uh, is something that you do not see um, as much. Obviously, there are some competition in nature, but definitely more collaboration. Um, um, so, so it is it is what we tend to use it for two reasons in the work that we do as an entry point. So. If someone is designing a solution to address a particular need or problem, we use it as sort of like the design brief, non-negotiable, if you will. So if you're going to design something that address a particular need to a, a group, let's try to incorporate them at the beginning uh, and, and see how you do in the process of iteration. And then uh, at the end, once you've come up with a potentially a, a minimal viable product, you use it as as a way to test your 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 solution. So not only you're testing with potential users, but you're also testing in line with how nature would potentially run uh, that process. So it, it becomes very helpful. Some of these principles are very hard to do. Obviously, the the, the friendly life chemistry. Um, there is a lot of good work going on, but there's a lot of challenges. So often companies struggle along the material side of it because unfortunately we're still very much embedded into the same thinking on how we solve uh, material elements uh, and then we tend to rely on these uh, very scarce materials versus rely you know leveraging uh, abundant materials um, so I, I'm looking at um, some of the other comments in there the, I mean if anyone could feel free to just chime in and ask a question so i i, I wanted to uh, do that actually and maybe before i do that just a quick comment to margo you you did break up a little bit um while you were talking before so maybe next time um just to improve your connection a little bit uh, just turn off your video for for the duration of uh, whatever you're saying i think that might help um I, I i think it was like that for everyone but i i had some trouble hearing you um so yeah um, regarding my question, I was actually also interested in the principles, and um, I'm, uh, I wanted to, to follow up on that, um, especially uh, asking the two of you, um, have you ever come across, uh, like now we're, we're talking about design principles um, that, that sort of follow the principles of nature, but obviously there are a lot of um, product services systems, organizations out there that are designed not very much following those principles. Have you ever come across a, a, a similar um, description of, um, let's say, the principles of, for example, industrial organization um, that directly are uh, going against the principles of nature and, and how we might find them? So for and realize a their dependency on sort of material or energy process and that really brings up these questions of why uh, and then certainly having so as you're doing this uh, visual mapping what I find very powerful is once people visually understand where certain resources are coming in into the system to be able to, to do a particular function then they start questioning do we need that uh, that process. There has been example, for instance, there was a chemistry company or actually a textile company that was looking at new dyes. Um, and part of the problem is because when they did an analysis of their operating costs, they realized they were spending a lot of money on protecting their workers from this uh, very, uh, very bad chemical they were using as a dye in their factory. And they were spending a lot of money on protective gear and processes, but also a lot of money on disposal and a regulatory process. 
So they identify this being a, a bottleneck in their system, and then they kind of say, well, is, how, is there other ways to make natural dyes? And they kind of migrate it suddenly into this space of biology and they explore biology and say, well, how does, how does nature create color? And that led to this innovation. So I don't know if I answered your question per se, but I think you know, looking at life cycle analysis and looking at this systemic approach in terms of mind mapping resources is really essential. I've seen that a lot happen also in the supply chain where people are understanding their entire supply chain. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the um, you know, profit and loss, but there are now an environmental profit and loss. Um, Puma was doing this work initially several years ago when they went and mapped out their entire process, right? So making tennis shoes requires a leather. Where does the leather come from? Um, so understanding the entire uh, externalities, if you will, really open up eyes to the, to the leaders of the company, but also really give them opportunities to rethink how they could potentially design their product and, and make it more viable. So I don't know if I answered your question correctly, but that's sort of what I, I would approach it. But I'll, I'll let Margot also uh, add to it if she wants. Um, coming at it from a, just a little bit different angle because I think Jacques covered that one quite well. Um, looking at um, energy production with coal, Brent Constance did that uh, and, and uh, looked for ways to actually turn that the energy production uh, area on its, on its ear and he started a company called Blue Planet and uh, so we know that carbon is sequestered um, in, in the ocean and in various natural sinks. Uh, and so what he did was invent a process of biomineralization um, that mimicked sort of uh, the creation of coral. And so instead of scrubbers, what he did was he, he harvested the carbon that was coming out of the smokestacks. And now uh, they have a, he actually has started a second company and the name of it is escaping me, but they, uh, through this whole production and, and interruption, as you were saying, Tim, um, looking at this harmful industry and turning it into a productive industry um, that was producing a chemical sink. Um, they've now created green cement, and uh, he is now working in his new company on a green aggregate, aggregate um, biomimetic, um, when I say green, biomimetic. Uh, so that's just an example of one company where it was a, a very harmful industry that can be, with a little bit different approach, set to, set to rights. Yeah, Margot, great. And actually, the company you're referring to is called Blue Planet. Um, and no, he started then another one. And Blue Planet, I knew, but he started a new company now. Okay, and they're so the ones. It's, that, not it's not Colera? That was the original oh, no, one. no, no, no. Blue Planet is the new one. Colera is the old one. Sorry, sorry. I yeah, got yeah, yeah, turned yeah. around. Okay. That's it. That's right. Um, and, I, I'm seeing a lot of good comments on the chat about. Uh, you know, the situation we're living now, you know, and the resiliency in, in nature, right? So, so the natural system, it's what's interesting in, in the natural system is it's this idea of, um, of resiliency based on, on uh, distributed networks, right? So think of a tree, the way the tree operates, it has, you know, uh, leaves. Each leaves are independently, independently uh, functioning as solar panels, but if one leaf falls, it doesn't work, the, the system still operates. And a lot of things in nature is really good ways for us to start thinking about a, a system that we live in. When we look at how, where we are now as a global economy, you know, a virus that is obviously very dangerous to, to, to humans right now, is disrupting an entire system. And it's realizing how a whole economic system is based on this very top-down political system, but also businesses are relying on, on, on systems that are, that are very fragile, especially on how we, we cope with disturbance, right? So even allowing people to work, work remotely, there's a lot of challenges around that. So I think there's, there's a lot of interesting things to look at how 
nature has you know this idea of adaptation but also a multitude of way to still be able to have the same to be stay, still able to, do, to perform the same way right so if, if there's a particular need uh, there's many ways to do that i mean a tree could photosynthesis through the leaves but it could also potentially do it through the bark right um and there's also uh ways the tree is able to uh, capture uh, oxygen to the soil as well. So, so there's there's this idea of a multifunctional approach to to one function, which in human system tend to be very simplistic in that approach uh, per se. So uh, um, that's an interesting aspect there as well. The other thing is when you're looking at something like COVID, and then you're looking at nature. Nature operates. And, and so does business from the very, very micro level all the way up to a very macro level. And so, you know, that's, that's an aspect of this is that you have to get more particular in describing what particular function is it that you're talking about with COVID. And when we, uh, when we deploy biomimicry, that's the first thing we ask uh, clients. Um, what is the function you're trying to solve for? And, and my favorite uh, example is making toast. You know, what are the, what's the function contained in making toast? Well, you're crisping and heating bread. And so if you, if you broke down COVID into all of the functions, because there's a lot of different functions going on here, multiple function, functions in terms of us infecting each other, um, multiple functions in terms of how businesses are slowing down or the, the stoppage that's going on, uh, functions at the global level and clear down to the local level. And so you really have to get very specific for what is the function that you're trying to address. Yeah, thank you, Margot. Um, there's another question about where you would find these principles, where a good summary of these principles. So one tool that, that I would um, potentially en engage you to look, uh, so the, the life principles, this is widely available. The, the document itself has more, a little bit more, a little bit more detailed information on how how it's how it could be used. But a tool that we uh, we use at the institute that is quite used by students is called Ask Nature. Um, and in Ask Nature, you basically use uh, use it as a search function. So you could search like things like how does nature filter water? How does nature create flexible structure? And it will give you uh, curated uh, information on examples of, of these, these ideas, and some of them do apply these principles uh, in the description of it. Uh, um, so that, that might be one place where you could find some of these resources. To be honest, uh, the life principle alone, there are, there are entire workshops that uh, different people are, are able, like I've provided in the past, where you go through the process of applying this principle to a particular challenge, uh, mostly using the design thinking process. Of, of, so it's combining the design thinking process with the life principle process. And that's, that's been very useful, uh, especially if we're looking at systemic problems. Um, so that, that's one way. Um, definitely the circular, the circular uh, I don't know if Anthony referring to the circular economy, I, I can't see, but that, yeah, you're referring to design lens. That's something you could actually uh, um, um, access to uh, to the web as well. So, and and the design lens lives in the world of biomimicry 3.8. Um, biomimicry Institute is their sister organization, and they have uh, a sort of, they've got it in a different form. And so if you wanted to look at nature's unifying patterns, you know, sometimes it depends on what side of the elephant you're looking on as to how much you understand about the elephant. And so that's another place that you can
Margo, we lost you. Yeah, Margo, we, we just lost you. Uh, Jacques, if you, I don't know if you want to add, otherwise I would, uh, I would say we, we should maybe use the, the rest of the time to invite other questions from the other participants, because I think we've, we've spent quite a bit now on the principles. Um, so yeah, please. Um, uh, I do have a hard stop in about nine minutes, but i um, happy to also answer questions via email as well. Um, I, I see a question in the chat, in the chat by Joshua. Um, I'm wondering, I haven't read it, should I just, I'll just read it out loud. He says, what would be the biomimetic principles for SME business to survive the um, COVID-19 shutdown? Um, he's interested in your comments about symbiosis between mushrooms and trees, not only for sugar mineral exchange, but of information. Um, he'd never heard about this. Uh, he wonders if SMEs could send a signal to the larger organization, big five central banks, that holding off on interest charges is necessary for the system. Um, if you would like to add on that, Josh, uh, feel free to do that. Otherwise, I would just hand that uh, question over to, to Jacques for now. Yeah, I think I got it all out there for now. Thanks. Great. Well, that's a great question. Um, so, yes, I mean, this idea of how in, in natural system, like what I briefly mentioned, you know, the forest, uh, and maybe, maybe some of you know this, but the forest is really what's below ground. It's quite amazing. There's really this entire network um, using the mycorrhizin, so the, so the fungi that lives under the forest that basically connects every single tree. And, and it is really um, a communication system that tree use to exchange information. And there's, you know, this is a fairly new area that's probably 10, 15 years old uh, research area. But there's a lot of elements showing, for instance, like a mother tree, like a, a much older tree, uh, the older tree in the forest tend to have the most connection with other trees. Uh, and what they also realize is the mother tree, the tree that let's say if it's a pine forest, they would also help smaller trees, the younger trees survive. So in case of drought, you would see actually a, a nutrient flowing from the mother tree to the smaller tree. So to go to your analogy about what we're living right now, if we take that principle of symbiosis relationship um, in this case, the tree and the other trees, but also using the mycorrhizin as this communication vehicle, if there was a way um, when you have a, a disturbance in the system where small businesses could signal their needs, right? If there is a, a, an easier way to say, you know, um, I'm faced with these types of operational challenges, uh, whether they're financial or, or physical, and and in this case of financial, having the central government being able to either provide direct support to these businesses or, or be able to, um, you know, potentially lessen the, 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 the requirements these businesses have to pay in terms of taxes and other things. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you think about right now what's happening, I mean, this is unprecedented the amount of money that is pretty much being created, right? It's not money that exists. It's just printed money that governments are creating to uh, really uplift the economy, but it's a very bureaucratic process, right? A lot of small businesses, is gonna, it's gonna take a long time to get that money flowing. So is there a, is there a way to be able to have a, a sensing mechanism out there where, where the small enterprise are able to really tell uh, the larger organization, their, their current health and, and have a way to share the resources a lot, much, a lot more efficiently and faster. Um, as you probably all know, SMEs are really the bread and butter of all economies and, and what are the most suffering. So I don't know if that answered your question. I'm happy to, um, you're happy to add more to it if you like. Uh, hopefully I did answer it. I, I guess it's, yeah, I'm thinking about, um, whether it's possible to um so that like at least in canada the banks are, are concentrating on, on bailing out uh people so providing uh material resource as it were um rather than um when you have something artificial as interest um mm -hmm. if that can be like uh similar to um the kind of signal that these 
fungi might uh, send. Um, al although your point is that they send it between the trees to then divert material resources to them. So I don't know. Right. I mean, yeah, I see. I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting. I mean, um, I mean, basically what you're saying is, if I understand correctly, I mean, it's, if, it's, it's the idea of having a better flow information between the different organizations like central bank and smaller businesses. Right now, the central bank, either low interest rate, which doesn't really do any good right now because it's, 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 not, it's not a financial issue. It's not liquidity in the market. Um, but uh, is, there, is there other, other ways to be able to really intervene in that system? And, and, it, and it could be that, you know, potentially loans that are provided by the central government to these very, um, you know, sensitive businesses that are, um, you know, uh, loans that they wouldn't have to repay, right? For instance, there's a lot of government doing that. It's, it's very debatable. Uh, but that could be that could be a direct assistance. So that could be the analogy of the tree helping a, a smaller tree in difficult uh, in challenge um, by by providing that influx of capital to allow them to survive. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that that further answers your question. Okay, uh, seeing as you have a hard stop in in three minutes, um, I saw two more questions uh, from Eric and from Griff. Eric has a question about the wording um, regarding evolve to survive and he thinks that uh, this sort of um, talks about surviving rather than thriving or flourishing. If there has any been, been any discussion around that, are we talking about surviving or flourishing? And then uh, Griff had a question about um, R&D and the incentive on effectively patenting nature's um, R&D. So uh, in case you can give a quick question, uh, sure. answer to both, or otherwise maybe just focus on on the one that you feel like you can uh, best. No, I can to. try to address both. Uh, so the, the the evolve to survive. I mean, again, these uh, these life principles uh, have changed over time. I, I could see the evolve to survive could be perceived as you know uh, not focusing on thriving. What what's important to remember is this idea that organisms would survive, uh, the survival in biology is basically about this idea, idea of, uh, of biological fitness. Um, so only those that have, you know, in this case, uh, successful approaches uh, will succeed. Uh, so it is, it is, and I could see the wording could be, could be potentially changed, but I think it is about the idea of thriving, right? Because if you're able to have, um, strategies that are that you could adapt to changing conditions if the strategies are successful then you are thriving in an ever evolving environment um, and 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 that is that is an important element there as well i mean the, the whole idea of integrating the unexpected is really important in in how in businesses where we tend to be very square in how we operate and not think of the unexpected right we I mean, it's a good example right now. A lot of businesses are struggling because they don't know how to operate in a non-traditional way. And I think that's sort of what makes it interesting there. But I agree with you. Maybe the, the wording could be changed. And the last question, um, so it's, it's this idea around R&D and the incentive on effective, uh, effectively patenting nature, it's, it's a huge debate. I personally, I have, from an ethical standpoint, I have a big challenge with that because I see people going out and, and we've seen this from big pharma, uh, patenting a particular molecule, um, even potentially functions like genes and the human genome. That, that is a huge concern to me is unfortunately, at least for now, how um, uh, a lot of the biotech companies have been, have been very clever and, and, and really convincing uh, patent offices around the world to to have to retain that amount of, of ownership, but it is a concern, and I don't know. Uh, in many ways, these innovations should be and should be uh, open. Should have some sort of open innovation platform. Shouldn't be owned by one entity. But then, from a, a funding standpoint, it could be challenging, right? Uh, investors want to be able to have some sort of patent. Uh, so maybe maybe the, the way to look at it is that we need to rethink the way we fund. Um, companies and we fund these strategies. Maybe we need to look at 
long term or slow capital type of uh, or impact uh, impact uh, investment type of approach. Great. Thanks, um, Jack. Um, I, I, I heard Anthony has a, a, a comment to make, so I just wanted to hand over to him before you have to leave. Yeah, I, I just I just wanted to first of all thank you for presenting today, and I appreciate uh, you, you bringing all the latest thinking uh, to us. Um, and there's some very exciting new examples that I hadn't previously heard, so thank you for that. Um, and uh, I'd like to close with a with a provocation um, for us to to take away. Um, the last time that I'm aware anybody sat down and really uh, wrote at any length about the, the, the integration of business and, and nature uh, was the work of our member Giles Hutchins um, back in uh, over, I think about 10 years ago. And um, um, Norbert and uh, Janice McDougall and I wrote a, a review of uh, uh, his book, which is called The Nature of Business Redesigned for Resilience. And one of the observations that we made in this, uh, the, the book is very interesting and I would recommend reading it, uh, but the observation we made in the, um, uh, in the book review was, uh, and, and I should mention that the book review was in Zygote Quarterly, which is if you're interested in anything to do with uh, biomimicry is a, is a great resource for keeping on top of things, but somebody would like to put the, the link to Zygote Quarterly in the, in the chat. Um, the, um, the, the observation we made about uh, what Giles was saying was that the examples he was giving of the design of business as opposed to the design of products or services, um, using life's principles was very much that the examples were um, uh, post hoc. The, the examples were applied after uh, the design had been done uh, rather than as an input into the design process. And so my provocation to this group is, um, you know, who's interested? How could we move forward a project that takes life's principles and turns them into something that could be used with uh, the Flourishing Business Canvas, for example, uh, so that as you're constructing post-it notes uh, or, or to, to validate the post-it notes, uh, you know, how, how could we do that? Um, or, or how could we uh, even use the life principles as, a, as an inspiration to what, could, what should the, the post-it notes say uh, on, on different topics? So I, I just leave that as an open question for us to think about. I think this would be a very, personally, I think this would be a very interesting and useful project for this group. Um, so if anybody's interested in moving that forward, then uh, please talk to, uh, to Tim and Laurie and, and we can figure out some, some next steps to, to see who's interested in moving that forward. So thanks again, uh, Jack and... Uh, uh, Thank you. It was a pleasure. And Roger, that was really good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. It's good to meet you all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for being with us today. Yep, we'll, we'll save the video and, uh, and make it available. Right. Thank you. You know. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.